views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. The good news is that we are all living longer. The bad news is that as we age, there are challenges older people face that need support and attention. And if that support is not there, then senior citizens become among the most vulnerable segments of our population. Here in the city of New York, United Neighborhood Houses, an organization that operates some of the city's best run settlement houses and community centers is taking the challenge head on to advocate for senior citizens in funding and programming. And specifically in our home borough of the Bronx, Bronx Works has put in place a homelessness prevention program for seniors that has proven to be successful, but without an influx of funding is in danger of being shut down. And so tonight we'll be joined by experts from UNH and Bronx Works to talk about quality of life for senior citizens, what programs are in place and still needed, and overall what kinds of funding need to be established to help grandma and grandpa and us all live happier, older lives. Please join me in welcoming UNA Senior Policy Analyst, Nora Moran, nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me. And the Bronx Works Assistant Executive Director, John Weed, nice to have you with us, John. Thank you, good I would say I would say once again, uh, and we'll tell the viewers, we were just talking about it, John was on the, this program in 1995. Oh boy. And so both of us have been at this for a very long time, but it's Indeed. nice to have Thank you very it's much. It's nice to finally have you back. Thanks. Um, Nora, let's uh, start with you. Give me a um, kind of a conditional overview of how senior citizens in the city of New York and of course the borough of the Bronx are doing. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, older adults in New York City are the fastest growing population. It's about 1.1 million people in New York City or roughly 13 percent of the city's population. Um, you know, they face unique challenges. Um, half of the seniors in New York City are immigrants, which is something that people don't always realize. So that comes with challenges of, you know, navigating if English isn't your first language or, uh, you know, receiving other supportive services. Um, the and, and if I can just interject, sure. and in this day and age, that's a particular challenge because some of them, even though they've lived long lives, may not have the proper documentation. So right. I guess, but uh, in, in this day and age, it has to be considered. It is, right. You also see a lot of people, uh, older adults, coming to the United States as they're older. So it's not like they were here when they were young, I but see. they're emigrating much later in life. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, additionally, uh, the rates of poverty for seniors in New York City are double the national rate, um, which is pretty significant. Costs of living are high in New York. All the things that we kind of know, uh, you know, know from just reading the newspapers and, and things like that. And I want to add in some of the numbers. There's been a dramatic increase in um, the young elderly, so to speak, mm -hmm. 60 to 64. Whereas, and and it, again, that's the good news, bad news. We're living longer. Mm -hmm. People are healthier longer as they age. Age, but of course that uh, creates um, uh, many more challenges. Uh, right. Most older adults want to age in their homes and their communities, Overwhelmingly um, but they so. need to have uh, connections um, to others in the community. Right. Talk to me about making those connections. Are we doing a good job? Do we have sufficient uh, activities and those kinds of things? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, you know, from our perspective, um, UNH really believes that New York City has a pretty strong already kind of safety net of lots of different programs uh, that can help older people. We have things like senior centers where people can go to socialize with their neighbors and receive a meal each day. 
um, naturally occurring retirement communities with our buildings or you know apartment complexes with high percentages of older people living there um, you know so that supportive services are put on site for them um, there's also home delivered meals case management home care programs um, so there's a lot kind of in place already the challenge is that you know none of these programs we feel are adequately funded to meet demand we're seeing in New York uh, wait lists for case management and for home care programs. Right now there's about 1,900 people on wait lists for case management services, about eight to 900 people on wait lists for home care services. Those numbers are only growing if there's no funding to support those programs. And, and I, I have to interject that mm -hmm. if you look at those numbers, first of all, it's very easy to say, well, eight or 900 in the scope of the city, but think about eight or 900 senior citizens. That's like a lot of people right. to not have services. And um, uh, in addition, uh, uh, those people are the ones who are counted, I'm willing to guess, it's probably an educated guess, that there are many senior citizens who are not on the list. Exactly. It's almost like the unemployment list because exactly. um, they haven't filed or they live with a, maybe a larger family mm -hmm. or you know they're isolated so they don't know that these kinds of services could be available. Exactly. So uh, you know, those numbers are interesting, but I personally would take them uh, with a grain of salt. Right. Um, and, and before we uh, bring John into the conversation and talk about um, the uh, really wonderful Bronx Works homeless this program mm -hmm. for seniors. Um, I, I just want to talk about um, what we hear all the time. And what we hear all the time, senior citizen centers are being cut. Certainly the, there's concern anything that's run by the federal government, some mm -hmm. of those uh, social programs would certainly uh, be in danger. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the, uh, the feeling of UNH and the policy people mm -hmm. on um, the, the stability of the funding uh, that uh, potentially, um, you know, here is being cut or mm -hmm. that runs these programs? Sure. So I think, you know, on the city level, um, there's always a challenge that we face every year and that significant amounts of funding for the Department for the Aging is, you know, for one year only. So, you know, the city council and the mayor go back and forth between large sums of funding for those core services that I just listed. Um, and, you know, year over year, they usually wind up with the city council putting funding in, but unfortunately the city council only has the ability to fund programs like that for just one year. So every year folks like UNH, like Bronx Works, have to go back to the city council to say, we need you, we need you to push the mayor to make sure that programs are supported. So, you know, we're caught every year in this dance uh, back and forth of what's going to happen. We just faced a pretty significant threat at the state level um, where a proposal would pull funding from uh, 65 senior centers in New York City. Our advocacy was successful and we were able to prevent that from happening, but you know, people are looking at these programs and there's always a concern that funding could go away. Uh, I'm going to bring uh, John Weed into the conversation, but I, I'm going to get back to you and we're going to talk about um, why, the, in my mind, these should be much higher up uh, the priority list. Mm -hmm. um, we all have grandmas and grandpas, you know. Uh, nonetheless, uh, John, this um, homelessness prevention project called SHPP, the Senior Homelessness uh, Prevention Project, um, has been going well. Why don't we start with the good part of it, talk about what the program is, why we need it, and uh, what you've been able to put in place so far. Uh, through a, a, a foundation grant, the Oak Foundation, we were able to establish this program about three years ago. And essentially, it uh, serves low-income seniors, 60, age 60 and above. And uh, we are seated in housing court. We actually uh, were put there by the supervising judge back in 2014. And, and so we have caseworkers that get referred cases, seniors, to the caseworkers. And they work in a holistic approach, both on the short-term eviction problem, but also the long-term um, you know, stay in your apartment problem. So some of the things that we do is we, we get back rent do one-shot deals, we get uh, private monies, and then we also work with the seniors around their benefits and also any sort of subsidy that they may qualify for. All of these things 
help seniors stay in their home. Uh, how large a, a network of, of professionals do you have? Is it like one or two people in Bronx Housing Court? And you were just mentioning before the show that um, conveniently Bronx Works is literally the building right next to Bronx Housing Court. That's right, at 1130 Grand Concourse. We have various programs in Housing Court. So we have a large office. We also work with families. Uh, so we have multiple programs. This particular project has four caseworkers and a supervisor. Mm -hmm. So um, it's working with a lot of seniors. We've seen over 500 seniors in the past three years, uh, 400 of whom may have been homeless if we had not interceded. How do you find out who the seniors are? I mean, do they call you? Do you find out from somebody else? Do you just kind of, you're around in court and somebody says, yo, come on well, in, there's, some, there's a senior citizen. How, do, well, how does certainly it over time our reputation uh, gets built up. But it's a unique program where judges actually know about our service and directly refer a senior that they see is in trouble. So that, so that a, a judge would say, you know, I can see this is not going well. Maybe we ought to bring this, the, you know, uh, Bronx Works in here and see if they can kind of coordinate some kind of uh, support. That's right. Uh, you don't know this, but I just happened to be reading the Bronx Times today and I opened up the paper and there was a letter from a senior citizen mm -hmm. talking about this program. So I want to, um, uh, uh, Lindsay has it, we're going to put it up on the screen. Great. And I'm going to read this letter, which really underscores what... Um, uh, you know what what uh, what uh, the concerns are so Lindsay let's uh, let's get that up on the screen can we do that there we go this letter was in the Bronx Times and it says I am 63 years old and I was sent to housing court because my husband injured himself at work and lost his income he was unable to assist me and I had other expenses I needed to cover when I was brought to housing court I was told to visit the senior homelessness prevention project and go to the next page, please. And since receiving help, this is the punchline, mm -hmm. I feel like a load is lifted from my shoulders. In addition to helping me with my arrears, my case manager is going to help me with my SCREE application. Mm -hmm. Once my arrears are paid off, I know I will be able to maintain my apartment, Sandra W. Well, there that, you go. The, right? Yes. I, I just made your case for yes, you. Yes, yes. Um, but, but that's really the point. And, and you know, when we bring guests on and, and they talk about their programs, Sometimes you don't immediately have confirmation, but that's exactly what it's about. And and I loved the the situation, very yeah. real situation. Here's a, a couple that was together. The, the husband had, had been the breadwinner, was not able to do it. You right. could see that playing out all over the place. And, and seniors are in a particular situation in that many of them are on very fixed incomes. And with the high price of rents throughout New York City, it's very hard for them to make uh, a go of it. So um, here we are. We've got this program now. Let's see. I got the, the amount. It's it, 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 $250,000 was the grant to run it. That's right. It pays for casework. It's another resources uh, that you need. Um, but the grant, as I understand, is running out. Yes. We Let's had a talk three, about the specifics. We had a three-year limit. It runs out June 30th of this year. And we have been trying to get it baselined or whatever in some sort of uh, budget in the city. We think it's important. We think... Uh, it could be in a department for the aging or, or one of the housing programs, but we feel it's important enough that the city, city should take uh, note of this. A uh, quarter of a million dollars within, in, in other words, if somebody were to write you a check of a quarter of a million dollars, that would save the program for what? For a year, for two years, for three years? We're running a quarter of a million dollars as an annual rate <coughs> in order to keep the four case workers and the supervisor. Uh, we also have some money in there that we uh, can pay out as a discretionary if the senior needs extra resources. So there are things that uh, in that budget that are very good for, for the population. Um, I will say, uh, Gary, that uh, you know the seniors, if a senior becomes homeless, the cost is enormous. That's mm -hmm. you know, I, I, if you didn't say it, I was going to say it. That and and that is really what I want to get mm -hmm. back to Nora about is you know, the contributions of seniors or, you know, much like if we end up incarcerating a young person that could have been rehabilitated in some other form, we end up all uh, paying a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to get back to the funding sources. Why doesn't the Oak Foundation, they, they can't well, re regenerate that grant? Oftentimes a foundation will have a, a, a fine time period, right? So a two-year, three-year, and it's a hard deadline because they don't want you to become so... 
um, dependent on their funding. And it, frankly, this is a foundation that feels that the city should take up the mantle. It's a, it's a city thing. Um, let's mm. talk to Nora first, then I'm going to get back yes. to you about what the real specifics are. But now let's talk about the whole concept of funding senior citizen programs. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say, well, okay, these are social programs. Obviously, we have, you know, police and fire and all the other things mm. that the city has to pay for. Why is this a good investment? John already addressed it somewhat, but right. explain to me why this is a good investment. Well, I think the point that John made is exactly the right one. You're investing in programs like, you know, the Senior Homelessness Prevention Project or Senior Centers or NORCs um, are so important from a prevention perspective because they help to save the public dollars in the long run. These are programs that are keeping people well fed so they're not malnourished and going to the doctor with lots of different illnesses that might come with that. Um, they're helping to prevent falls from happening and we know that, you know, if someone falls in their home, breaks a hip, breaks a leg, it's well, terrible. And, and frankly, we're all paying for it. Right, I, I exactly. Mean, if you're looking from then, purely a financial situation, mm -hmm. you know, that, that right. is what happens. Folks go into the hospital, um, you know, into homeless shelters, nursing homes, um, and nobody wants that. The public doesn't want it because we don't want to pay for that. You know, seniors don't want that because they want to remain in their homes. So these, you know, supportive services are just do so much in order to help keep people in their homes, in their communities, and healthy and happy. So many times on this program, I wish we could just make the decisions here, because you made a great case. <laughs> I agree with you, and mm -hmm. so let, I'll just go do the funding. What, what's the difficulty, then, in, in getting these kinds of things funded? Because I mentioned earlier, kind of in my own snarky way, that, mm -hmm. you know, everybody has a grandma and grandpa, and, and you know, don't you want them to do well? But you've, right. you've um, underscored it in a, you know, very practical way. Mm -hmm. well, why can't we get like what's the argument or I mean that's that's a great question you know sometimes it's it's challenging to understand from our perspective why you know there isn't more attention paid to these issues um, I well, think that's what that, we're trying to do here I guess that's right exactly is. you know I think that um, oftentimes you know it's it's a blind spot for people sometimes you know it's just because they're not used to thinking about supporting older people, um, that it just doesn't come up in, in budget negotiations. And we'll always say that you know, a budget a budget is a, a statement of priorities and a reflection of someone's priorities. And it feels you know, disheartening that every year we have to fight the city to say, you know, we need more funding for senior services. Mm -hmm. um, so we would love to see the city put a higher priority on aging services moving forward because it, you know, seniors are the fastest growing population, et cetera, et cetera. Um, John, uh, maybe I should have asked this before. What happens to a senior citizen if they don't have this program? And, they, and they, like the, the woman who wrote that letter, if she doesn't have this program, what actually does happen to that person? Like what's the, the play out if, uh, God forbid, you lose the program? I mean, they could be uh, evicted and God forbid they'd be homeless. Um, and, then, the, and then specifically what happens to them? Well, Going to the shelter system? There, would be, there are certain shelters that serve seniors. Um, or there would be a shelter that's like a drop-in center where, you know, they'd sleep on a chair. But, I mean, God forbid. I mean, it, you know, I'm sure it happens. It, it, it's horrible for anybody, I have to say. But when you think about a senior citizen who really, in many cases, will need support, whether they're 60, 70, 80 years old, they're going to keep needing support. We haven't had any seniors that we work with be evicted. So of the seniors that have come to us, we've resolved uh, most cases. Cases that haven't been resolved, seniors may have moved or whatever, but nobody right. has become homeless. So, so I guess in a way it's asking you a question that you'd rather not think about because you haven't had to directly deal with it. That's right. Um, so what's the dialogue now about in, um, uh, in the city council we have, to come up with? I'm sure you're hitting it hard. We have. In, in fact, last Friday I drove with some of my colleagues to five different city council um, people's offices mm -hmm. to drop off literature to talk to them. We have been meeting with uh, the city council all along. They seem supportive. Uh, it's now uh, the city is in the budgetary process and so we're hoping that something will come through. The city council could enact a special initiative where um, they would vote that this would be a priority and they could uh, uh, actually vote it into the budget. So we're looking forward to hopefully that having 
happen. You know, I look at, uh, again, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. I look at the, the um, $250,000 yeah. in the scope of the budget and considering the impact that this program potentially could have, it would seem to me almost like a no-brainer. I, I mean, I think we can all find programs and things that get funded for more money that are less effective or less important. Yes, $250,000 is a drop in a bucket. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm generally not shy. Do you want to mention uh, any of the um, uh, Bronx City Council members who are, um, let's put it this way, who are supportive or uh, ones that are, are considering it, or do we not want to go there on television? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. I'm everyone that we've uh, met with, uh, Vanessa Gibson, has been very uh, supportive of this uh, initiative and others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fr uh, last Friday, I, I, as I say, we, we dropped literature off. I didn't talk to... Uh, uh, a person that, that those days, but I talked to chief of councils and they were all very uh, supportive of the mm -hmm. initiative. At what point might you know or not know what might happen? Well, Nora would be more uh, expert oh. at that, but I think uh, the city <laughs> right. process will go through sometime in, in June. Mm -hmm. okay. The city fiscal year ends uh, June 30th, so they'll have to have a budget in place by that point. So probably in you know early to mid-June is when negotiations really heat up, so we should know by then. I, I want to ask you about um, uh, NORC programs mm -hmm. and the importance of NORC programs. Um, and uh, uh, so, so why don't you just review that a little bit and let's talk. Do we have sufficient number of NORC uh, communities in the city? And if not, mm -hmm. how could we build more of them so more seniors are involved, there's less isolationism and all those kinds of things? Right, right. So NORCs, as you know, are naturally occurring retirement communities. Uh, they're really wonderful programs that look at areas where there are a lot of older adults living there, either apartment building, complex neighborhood, and work with older residents and social service providers and housing providers to figure out what are the best ways to support older people in this neighborhood and what do older people actually want for themselves and identify as their own needs. Um, there's quite a few programs within the Bronx that are running. Um, and uh, actually the comptroller just released a report, I believe in March, um, that looked at all the NORCs throughout the city and found that there's lots of areas that could benefit from having a NORC that don't have that one don't now. Have yes. So What's the, do you know offhand what the amount of money is that it would take to, to establish one? Um, they run from between about $100,000 to $250,000, um, and usually those programs rely on lots of different partnerships, so it's a social service provider, a health care provider, a housing provider, all kind of pooling their resources to run a great program for older people. Uh, you know, I'm just too much of a logical thinker. These things just make uh, total mm -hmm. sense to me. I know um, uh, some of the other policy initiatives that you work with at UNH involve mental health. I'm thinking that um, if you combat isolationism with seniors, mm -hmm. you are then taking one less sort of problem that you on the mental health uh, side uh, would have to deal with. Right. How big, you know, this is something I'm always concerned about. How big a problem is isolationism for senior citizens? You know, it's very hard to measure because it's the kind of thing that people don't always identify themselves as having. Um, you know, sometimes it's a, a shameful thing for someone to say of any age, I'm lonely or I feel, you know, isolated from other people. We can look at things that we know in terms of areas where um, a lot of older people live alone. Um, you know, there are certain risk factors for being socially isolated. Um, you know, living alone, living in poverty, not speaking English very well, um, being a caregiver, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a real concern and we're learning more and more from public health researchers that uh, social isolation and loneliness can be as deadly to someone's health as cigarette smoking. And it certainly would, would you know, would contribute to their deterioration. And, right. And I, I have a, a friend whose mom um, is healthy enough to live in her apartment, mm -hmm. but she doesn't really get out. She's isolated a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that she can continue to stay mentally fit mm -hmm. without that kind of interaction. There's no question. Right. So these kinds of things are, are so vital. You wanted mm -hmm. to add something? Part, Part of the, you know, the reason for the uh, senior centers is that it combats uh, isolation. Mm -hmm. Seniors can come out and they can spend the day in a center, have breakfast, lunch, have, uh, you know, uh, activities. Uh, we also operate in ORC, and I can tell you, are very, very good. I mean, uh, for somebody to live in a, in some place for 25 or 30 years and then have a place to go to to get medical services, mm -hmm. to get uh, geriatric 
mental health services. It's Somebody to talk to if something that's comes right. up that's negative. Or I have to tell you, and we all know what senior citizens are like, if they have good news to share, it's nice to have somebody to share that's with. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Grandson graduated or, or whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, before we go, I want to ask you about other boroughs. And I'm wondering, yes. so you we have this program here, and you talk to Bronx Council members, and they're like, oh, of course. Um, do other boroughs have anything like this? And the, the fact that some might not, does that make it more difficult to convince them to vote to, to fund these things? We think we have a unique program and we're one of a kind in New York City. And yes, that makes it a little bit more difficult because there aren't others doing the same work. There are, there are bits and pieces out there, but a comprehensive program like we have, we don't think exists. Mm -hmm. Nora, I'll give you the final word. Uh, and I love asking this question. Mm. If you were the mayor or if you could control <laughs> the budget, mm. um, how much money would you think would be appropriate? I know you, <laughs> the more the better. Uh, right. Would you, would do you think we really need? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, UNH has been working with a couple other advocate groups to kind of think through that, through that question like what specifically. Is, what, are, what is our request? What does it take? Um, and we've identified uh, that $60 million would be needed, you know, right now in Again, order to in right size. Things, that's just not, I'm sorry to say right. it doesn't sound like that much money right. uh, in, in, in the scheme of things. Well, listen, you guys are doing great work. I mean, I can't help it when I do these kinds of shows. I have to advocate for what I believe in. Mm -hmm. And that's why we had you here. I think the, these are very important. They um, will pay for themselves in the long run mm -hmm. and uh, pay for, um, for all of us to be happier and healthier. And look, if Grandma and Grandpa are happier and healthier, Aren't we all? John Weed uh, from uh, Bronx Works, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Norm Moran, say hello to all my friends at UNH. I will. And uh, folks, if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the borough of the Bronx, then email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You can send us a tweet at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page, and we'll read them on the air during a future edition of our program. You can check out the archives at bronxnet.org. you find Bronx Talk on the lower right Navigation Bar, we thank our producer who is Lindsay, our director is Brianna, and to the cast of thousands that are here, to you, to them, to Grandma and Grandpa. Good night. <laughs>